Uno. Hello, and welcome to Tell the Damn Story with veteran award-winning authors Alex Simmons and Christopher Ryan. On Tell the Damn Story, we celebrate the trials and tribulations, the challenges and joys of creativity, and hopefully along the way, help you tell your own damn stories. That's right. All right. Hello, Alex. How are you? Hello, 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 Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us today. Now, today yes, we do. Uh, you know, we lied to the audience. Do we, we, do we actually do... lie? Do we fabricate? Yes. We lied to the audience. We said that we were going to do two episodes a month, one with a guest and one just us. However, yes. <laughs> something happened with this guest that is so unique and such a great teachable moment that we broke our own rule right out of the gate. So because we can. That's yes, we can. Damn it's it. our show. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, let us please introduce you to the one, the only, Teal James Glenn. How are you, sir? I, I am good. Thank you very much. And there's so, a reason there's only one of me. The universe only. cannot stand to have a variant. Uh, well, that's true. <laughs> Plus, you're so damn busy that there's no time to clone you. Yeah, well, look, he's had to clean the bat cave and everything. I mean, yeah. Now, for people who want to know more about who Teal James Glenn is, his background, uh, there's an upcoming uh, uh, pulp, uh, Pulpster profile that is going to be on PulpFest.com that I wrote about Teal James Glenn. And it talks about the many lives that Teal has lived because Teal has, Teal has been everything. So wait, he's amazing. not a clone, he's an immortal? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think he is. He <laughs> okay. might be the Highlander. I'm okay. not sure. <laughs> I, I almost so, was. <laughs> yeah, is that right? That's true. Uh, Teal has been a writer, of course, but is also an actor, a stunt person, a stunt coordinator. Um, he has been in movies and TV shows that you have seen, especially if you watch some soap operas. He's been in those too. Uh, he got punched out by Hawk and Spencer for hire years oh, ago. Yeah. And it wasn't the last punch he took. <laughs> yeah. Avery Brooks smacked you, huh? Okay. I, called, I called him a clown and he, he punched me and said, I don't work for Ringland Brothers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which was his improv. It wasn't the scripted line. But it was oh, what, what was great line. Great <laughs> line. Uh, he also um, has done uh, Renaissance Fairs, run Renaissance Fairs. He is a, um, I guess you would say, a weapons expert because he has done work with swords, with uh, guns, with... Um, I uh, nuclear devices jousting right jousting jousting knives guns swords axes um just yeah and so and besides that <laughs> you've written 500 and what oh i 513 manuscripts 513 <laughs> manuscripts yeah 43 books 43 that's novels. amazing and he is here to teach us today why you know there were a lot of episodes we do a how to right this is a why to why to keep on writing because ladies and gentlemen september and october of 2021 has experienced the teal james glenn explosion and we will tell you what that's all about <laughs> yes it is so that's what we're going to talk about um Alex, should is there something I didn't cover somewhere? No, you I'm sure. You, no, no, I'm sure you did. I so I just want to get started very quickly, just very very short, because you know it just gives him a little bit of earth. You've made him seem like such a god that I just would like to bring him down to earth just for a second here. Small you know, G. Where were you born and where were you raised? I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. You want to argue about it? Uh, <laughs> in, Flatbush, in in Flatbush itself, actually. Uh, and, that's you know, where they that's where they raise the swords fight <laughs> the swords yeah. and uh, I, I now live in the wilds of Weehawken Weehawken uh, NJ okay yeah, yeah. 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 So I have a better view of Manhattan than Brooklyn does frankly well Manhattan. you know that's true. That, that yeah I lived off I lived in Flatbush for a short time off of Cortelyu Road that was very, East 39th Street between Clarendon and Cortelyu that's there you I, go uh, there you go okay right yeah. cross cemetery We'll share. Yeah, did you oh, sign? Did you sign that uh, petition to get him out? I think. Uh... 
So, okay, so now we can, we can, because we got so much to cover in such a short period of time. Let us, you, you had a nice uh, agenda there, Chris. So let's, yes. let's start with, what well, is the first, the first? Well, the first thing we want to talk about is that 2021 started out pretty nice for Teal James Glenn. Um, Killing Shadows came out, as in one of his novels. Uh, Teal, tell us a little bit about Killing Shadows. Uh, Killing Shadows is a modern day thriller. It's about John Shadows, who is the son of a Pope era hero uh, who went by the professional name of Dr. Shadows and then legally changed his last name to Shadows. It was Shadow. And um, so he was raised literally in the shadow of a hero and kind of rebelled against it uh, in his early years and um, had a horrible relationship in college. And his mother, uh, but his father was dead by this point, his, his mother said, look, you, he started to drink. So he said, you can get yourself together. You can either go into the Marines like your father, or you can go train with your uncle Kenji in Japan. Uh, his mother was a ninja assassin for the emperor during World War II ah. and met his father when she tried to kill him the first time. Um, That's an and, interesting so, first date. <laughs> uh, and uh, several times during the war, they interacted. Eventually they got together. And uh, so he, she always considered he took the coward's way out because he joined the Marines and went to Afghanistan. Um, <laughs> and um, the easy he, way out. Easy way out. But he now he he now understands his father and now is the chief investigator for the Shadows Foundation for Justice, which his father established. Um, it's very much a um, a mirror of inspired by Doc Savage in that sense, that his, mm. the original Dr. Shadows was. And, um, and so his, he is there to be the help for the helpless and the hope, last go. hope for the hopeless. And, and uh, in Killing Shadows, he runs into the college girlfriend who destroyed him, who needs his help now, and gets involved in uh, essentially what I think of as martial arts noir. He gets involved right. in a case with international assassins and corporations and uh, cyber madmen. Um, and meanwhile, Mama-san is there uh, needling him and backing him up at the same time. Yeah, it, it, well, well into her 80s. The word yeah. needling there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. um, and, and while, you know, many others will say, hey, I got published this year, and that's the end of it. Also this year, <laughs> Uh, Chronicles of the Skull Mask came out. Now, you, this has been Skull Mask. The idea of Skull Mask has appeared, you know, you've done stories throughout the years, but now it's kind of all coalescing in a collection. Can you explain what the, the, um, yeah, the, the, the Skull Mask was my attempt to go back to the, the, the weird uh, shutter pulps uh, of yore. Um, the premise is it's, it's a mask which is made from the skin of the first victim. Uh, it is- So it's uh, a family it's, story. Yes, it is, it's generational. Uh, it is enchanted and uh, it appears and is worn by someone who needs just vengeance. And um, to the present day, there have been 157 who've worn it. And mm. they have been uh, a Native American, a former slave, a World War I pilot. Uh, and this collection is six different stories that takes place in six different time periods and actually are the six different types of pulps. Uh, each story, cool. there's a horror story, there's a crime story, there's a Western story, um, there's a Mass Avenger story, uh, there's a reporter story. Mm. Um, and at the end of each story, when justice uh, revenge is justice is served, the mask disappears. Long live the skull mask. And it, the idea is it's a uh, generational thing. And anyone who wears the mask has the memories and abilities of anyone who has worn it before. So mm -hmm. it is the one hero that is many. Uh, so, and, and is this is this an original concept or is this? Yes. Uh, yeah. yes. So this I created yours. it. I, I hope someday. I, like some characters in the pulps are bigger than the writer. I hope this one's bigger than me. I actually hope to put together an anthology at some point with other writers writing their version of, of Skull Mask stories. I would love that to happen. One of the problems I have is to 
for the skull mask to appear, really horrible things have to happen to the character. This isn't a and, problem in this day and age. <laughs> well, see, I hate doing that to people. So uh, they're few and far between for me because I really hate to give people such horrible, miserable times. Ah. But I know so many people who like to, uh, some really good horror writers, that I would love to eventually do a second collection, which would be one by me and five or six by other authors. Um, gotcha. gotcha. And it, in theory, can go on forever because... Uh, the, oh, it's, it's I, the, I, I, the first case, the first mask was in 1761 uh, in Burma. After that, there could be as many to now to the future. You could have a skull mask on Mars. It could appear because it's because it's magical and not really explained. It would right. be called the Elon skull mask. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, That's terrible. Um, Elon skull. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so now. two in one year, two great collections or uh, um, uh, publications, but that's really not what caught my attention when we were working on the um, profile. It's really September and October that is- Of this year. Of this year is unique and fun. And it is a great, you know, we always are saying to, uh, a lot of our audience are emerging writers or emerging creatives. And we say, you know, you work on a story, you finish it, you polish it, put it to the side, come back to it, edit it. Okay. And then when it's really, really ready, then you send it out and begin something else immediately. Always begin and continue writing. You're such a, uh, uh, I mean, you have had a, a career already, but this ex experience really kind of points or underscores why to keep writing. Um, because COVID kind of got in your way, huh? Um, I, I got to say, last year I wrote six novels and 31 short stories. So uh, I'm, not creatively, uh, and publishing wise. <laughs> uh, publishing wise, yes. I had one book come out last year that um, amazingly it won an award. And uh, I'm one of those people who thinks I'm never going to win anything. So I just, you know, that's uh, obviously uh, hadn't stopped you. Carpathia. This and, is a, a cowboy in Carpathia. And, and could you delight Alex with explaining what this is? All right. Robert E. Howard, the creator of Conan and right. uh, many other great characters and sort of the father of modern sword and sorcery uh, was a big inspiration for me. And um, I, thought what would you know, everyone always says oh my god if he'd only had five more years because he really at the point he died the point he took his life he was really just on the pinnacle of something else and so i said well what would have happened if he did not shoot himself mm. and that's the premise of the book and then i said okay he's such an incredible figure himself the guy used to do bare knuckle fighting and sword fighting in the, in the ice houses and like he would be and he would be a character so I start the story with the moment of his death not happening, where he chooses not to. Uh, he puts the gun down, goes in and reads poetry to his mother till she dies. And with the inheritance she gives him, he goes to New York to meet writers and then goes on a tour of Europe. And of course, in this particular world, he happens to meet... Um, Mina Harker and Jonathan Harker. And for and, anybody who reads that, those names should be familiar. Go on. And, Go on. Uh, and, and that, and their daughter, which is what uh, leads him to eventually go to Carpathia, where he meets the uh, Prince of Wallachia, who is trying to get his act together again to reinvade uh, London, because in this world, he was repelled, but not killed. Mm. And um, and so you uh, uh, at one point, me, uh, Gwendolyn confronts Dracula, and um, and Dra and Dracula says, "I'm not afraid of poets," because she's heard here one of his poems, and she says, "This this man's from Texas. You should be." <laughs> <laughs> and um, and it's the first in a series. Um, the second book um, 
might be out later this year, but probably early next year, um, which is uh, The Cowboy and the Conqueror. And uh, where it, I take it the next step further, where he meets a, a pulp writer while he's on a tour in Egypt and eventually confronts Yag Sagoth, one of the Cthulhuan monsters. Um, yeah. And an evil oh. Winston Churchill. That's fantastic. Yeah. So one of the fathers of pulp as a pulp hero is a, just a wonderful, wonderful idea. Um, but then September and October happened. Now you, you yeah. won that award earlier on. And you I won that kept... award early this year, which still stuns me. I mean, I, I have it sitting here behind me and I look at it every once in a while and I can't, I can't believe it because I didn't put in for it. Somebody put, put in for me, you know, some people gave some wonderful reviews to the, to the story. And um, I mean, I, I decided a long time ago, I'm doing this because I'm doing this, not, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to get a mansion in a yacht unless it's a really tiny, like, you know, corgi mansion. <laughs> um, and um, I'm not going to make a lot of money on it. Um, but I have stories I want to tell and places I want to go. And I mean, I write the stories because I want to find out what happens. Now, uh, at, at, at risk, Teal, of ruining the moment of the rest of the show, um, there was a time when I was so sick, I couldn't read. And when I got a little better, I just, I just wanted to sit quietly and read. And I opened up uh, the Kindle White because the glare would be the least of them. And it happened to be, you know, I was not finished yet reading the Cowboy and Carpathia when we did the profile. So I began to read. And that is what really helped me through uh, my recovery is being able to lose myself in that story. So that's how special that story is. I, I, I can't think of a greater praise. That's why I write. I write because when I was 15, I had no heroes. Mm. I had no one. And I was given Doc Savage and Tarzan and John Carter. And I was homeless for a couple of years. Mm. And when I was homeless, my motto was, I yet live, which is John Carter's cry. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the reason I write, I want to give that to other people. And if- Well, I'll tell you I, what, I can't, you were a lifeline that I really needed. I, I would like to just jump in here, uh, just, just because this is a really important moment here that um, it's funny. There are people that we've interviewed, um, but also people that I've met along the way. And then there's my own personal stories. And I think that it's, it's really interesting what you just said, Teal, about uh, not having heroes at the time you were growing up or at a certain time period when you were growing up because I, you know, my mother raised me and my father was not in the picture. And a lot of the male figures that I look to for some sort of moral compass were characters in books or on television. And as an African-American, you know, people, especially during that time period, the 60s and so forth, the 50s and the 60s, there were no black characters who are heroic figures that I could look to. And I remember as a child, as a teen, certain part of my teen years, not caring what color they were so long as I could get lost in the stories. And, and these guys were heroic figures and I could sort of carve some sort of a, uh, a mantra for myself out of that. And so what you're talking about, I mean, you know, John Carter and, and some of these other characters, you never went to Mars to, to the best of my knowledge. But, you know, you were able you were able to go somewhere else other than where you were. And that place was a salve or a comfort place or a nurturing place or a place of strength. And that's what I think a lot of stories are for people, male, female, black, white, whatever. Um, if you can write a good story and you can pull people into it, it is a comfort place. Sometimes it's an escape or a getaway or a home base from which they can draw strength. So I um, thank you for bringing that up. And Chris, I Absolutely. know how much that meant. Yeah, so yeah, thank well, you. I, I gotta say that, that um, when people talk now about, oh, you know, we're having, you know, people are upset that there's like no white people in Shang-Chi. 
uh, except for one guy with a razor arm, you know, and mm-hmm. they're upset about the work. There's only one white guy in, in Wakanda. I'm like, I wear leather. I love leather jackets and pants because of Richard Roundtree. <laughs> I, I will tell you now that I don't care what the wrapping of the hero is. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, the, the character matters to me. And I know that my friends who are African-American, they had to make that adjustment when there were no choices, when there was no Hawk, when there was no, you know, Chadwick Boseman, where, you know, you had, you were allowed to have one black hero in films. You were able to have, you know, there was Sydney for a while, and then you were able to have Denzel for a while, but you only allowed to have one. Yeah. And, and even um, in the spaghetti westerns, you could only have Woody Strode. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> you know, that was and, it. Yeah. And, he, and he was passing for, for Pacific Islander anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, and the fact is, is that if you create characters, your audience is going to go there. If you yeah. give us real people and it, it, you know, yeah, for a while, maybe it's going to swing in one direction where suddenly it'll be so niche that, that it will put some people off, but eventually heroes will be heroes and it won't matter what their color is. It won't matter what their yeah. shape is. It won't matter what their sex is. Right. I mean, everybody roots for black widow. You yeah. know, and I, I, ha- I don't have her equipment and I still want her to win. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's, it's really important. One of the things that I noticed as a kid growing up, TV was important to me. I was, I was a very sickly kid. And the first black man I saw who wasn't a servant was a sergeant on Peter Gunn. Mm. Sergeant character who didn't have to be black. He just happened to be for I think probably 20 episodes or 30 episodes. I'm not sure. Uh, he's, he's in a couple of the series. Um, and he was like, when, when, when he wasn't there with his, you know, detective friend, he'd go to the sergeant and he'd be like, oh, come on, let me borrow the book, you know, with the, with the guy. And he's like, I can't let you have it, Peter. He says, hey. <laughs> and, and it had nothing to do with his skin color. It was completely about the character. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's, that's the, the, the I spy solution. You know, yeah, yeah. we're just going to be, and we're not going to mention, and you know, and then of course, then it was Kelly. You know, um, Scotty and Kelly were were the thing. So, I to me, it's always been about. Uh, I mean, we we face the whole you can't write outside your lane now thing a lot, but it still comes down to if you write real characters, you're writing real characters, and it's That's not right. Be wrong. Oh. That's right. You know? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> You know, that that whole write your lane thing is something that I torture myself about. You know, I I grew up with heroes, but I also grew up with a lot of villains. And the things that uh, the characters that helped me get through were characters like the Falcon. You know, I love the comic book Captain America and the Falcon. But, you know, I was getting allergy shots every week and, it, and not a single one of them ever turned me into a super soldier. So I, I really thought I had a, a better chance of being the Falcon. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, you wanted to, because you, you've set it up a couple of times. About yep. I want to get to get September and October. So hit us with blizzard, September and October. <clears throat> blizzard of publications. So we're going to do kind of a lightning round to show now. And then I'm going to ask, well, the backstory of, you know, why did they all come out at once? But first, here we go. So uh, in a few short weeks, we got um, the Reindeer Games, which shows up in the Who Done It anthology of short mysteries. Tell us a little bit, uh, a sentence or two about the Reindeer Games. Uh, it's it's a, a spoof. Um, a couple of years ago, I wrote for a Christmas anthology, a charity anthology uh, that had to be based on songs, holiday songs. So of course it's it's a murder mystery where they find grandma and she's covered with reindeer hooves. Uh, <laughs> cool. um, I heard about her getting it, run over by that. Yeah, yeah and it's <laughs> it's written it's written it's Joe Christmas and his partner Kenny Krampus, and it's okay. written totally as a spoof of of Dragon. Cool. Um, now, uh, De Gin and Tonic for Pulp Adventures magazine. Tell us about uh, that. It's um, uh, it takes place just at the partition of Palestine. And it's a British officer who is trying to track down um, an Arab terrorist. And um, his, uh, his friend is, a, is an, uh, an Arab um, 
curio dealer and they meet to play chess every week. And the curio dealer is killed because he's a moderate. He's assassinated by this, um, and I stole this, El Barak is the name of the assassin. Um, and, um, and, but the last thing he does before he dies is he uh, is wrapping a present for the Englishman, which is a, 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 a niblis box, which is a, a, an Arab puzzle box. And so the assassin hides a bomb in it so that when he opens it, it will kill him. But it happens to be an actual Ibis box, so there's a gin in it. So as he's opening it up, he makes a wish. And because of that, the effect uh, of uh, 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 Read the story. No, no, no. no read no. the story. To yeah, find no, out no. <laughs> I wasn't going to give it away, but yeah. there's an actual gin involved. Yeah, in fantastic. And the gin is spelled D J I N N, right? As opposed yeah. to the Which Brooklyn is pronunciation. When I was yeah, first right. reading this list, I thought the reindeer games would be a serious one and that the gin and tonic would be a spoof, but no. no. <laughs> All right. I switch Third. it up here, yeah, you know. Yeah, switching it, you know. So uh, the, the next one, one is Sword and Sorcery novella, Cost of Life, which is in the anthology Quests Untold from Pro Se Press. And give us a sentence or two about that one, please. Okay, I have a, I have a, a fantasy world called Altiva. Um, I've been writing Altiva stories for 40 years. Wow. And uh, I have a, a fairly big chunk of them. And um, Cost of Life, um, a lot of the stories follow um, Eric Schaut, um, who is a priest of the Kova, which is uh, one of the religions on the planet. And um, it's like a, he's like a Shaolin monk in many ways. They train him in, in healing and in martial arts as well as the religion. And uh, this follows his friend um, and companion that he grew up with, who's his like sister, buddy, Arina. Her lover died three months before. And they go on a quest because there's word in the old text of a cult that could prolong life. And he's trying to give her any hope he can. Mm. Um, and uh, they, it involves them with pirates and magic and uh, drunken sailors. So ah, um, an excellent triumvirate there. Yes, right. yes. <laughs> so, so we go from there. Wait a minute, I got to do this one. I got to do this one because you know this. I'm oh, close to course, this. I'm of close course, to this. Of right. Okay. Uh, Alex, what was the next one? The next. Funny you should ask, Chris. The next well, one is you know. this solo Doctor Watson story, right? And it says here, Dr. Watson's locked room story, A Study of Death, is in something called Mystery Magazine, right? It's coming out? Yes, a, it used to be. Mystery it, Magazine here. It used to be called Mystery Weekly, and they just changed the name to Straight Up Mystery Magazine. Yeah, that was okay. Mystery Weekly, yeah. And uh, yes, it's, I, it's actually, it's a murder mystery. Um, it takes place uh, about three months after Holmes supposedly died. Ah, the Reichenbach Fall thing, yes. And Watson is called in by Mycroft to help out um, a um, Middle European royalty where uh, somebody was murdered uh, and uh, the suspicion is on them. It happened in their embassy. Now, Mycroft cannot act officially. So he asked Watson to unofficially visit the embassy with the princess and try and clear up the mystery. Mm. And of course, using his friend Holmes' methods, he does. Of course. Um, Excellent. He's it, a good it, it, is, it is a, an actual locked room murder mystery kind of deal. Cool. Ah. And following that is your collection of occult detective set, uh, tales, Sempa mm -hmm. Occultus, which is right yes. here. There cool. we go, Sempa I'm Occultus. Happy. Talk to us about Simpa. Okay. Semper Occultus is actually the motto of the British Secret Service. It means always secret. Mm. Uh, and in this case, Dr. Uh, Augustus Argent is the um, minister without portfolio for occult affairs for the British crown. He is essentially the court sorcerer. Um, and there has been one since Elizabeth the Great, the first Elizabeth. Um, because that's the reason the Armada was destroyed, that a coven of witches uh, and sorcerers got together and created 
the um, uh, good Lord, I've just blanked on the name of my own thing. <laughs> uh, the, the Solomon Doctrine. And the Solomon Doctrine prevents uh, invasion, magical invasion of, of, of the country. It doesn't stop all magic and it doesn't stop all sorts of sorcery, but it, all of the prevalent ones are either weakened or stopped at the border. And he may or may not be that original sorcerer. We don't know. We don't know his age, but it's basically mm. the Holmes Watson formula. His assistant is Jack Stone. And there are a series of novellas and short stories that go from uh, werewolves to vampires to um, uh, curses that go back to the Roman occupation uh, and um, lions and tigers and bears. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, I mean, I think of the, a number of the Jack Stone stories to me are Hammer films that I've written. Got That's, you. I view them. Uh, Got I see you. them in those colors. But some of them, there's, and there's a couple that are mysteries that seem occult, but are actually empirical solutions. Mm. Um, I, I very much love the Lord Darcy stories uh, by Randall Garrett. And one of the nice things about it was the solution to the mystery sometimes was not occult, but you wouldn't know it until you got to the end of the story. Exactly. And I, I do that with some of these. Um, but they're, they're a little more high adventure than Holmes, but they have a lot of that Holmes feel to them. And this is the next book, Semper Fortis, will be out next year, which is a second collection. Right. Uh, and Excellent. I may or may not do a novel. I have an idea for a novel in my well, head. Well, you have a free weekend, you will, right? Yeah. 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 yeah right. Well, we've got one more, then we get to ask, how the hell did this happen? Um, Tommy Zambush uh, from, uh, appears in a Mast Avenger magazine. Tell us a sentence or two about Tommy. And okay, his Tommy ambush. Zambush is, uh, I've written a series of short stories, uh, well, a series of novellas with uh, a character called Declan Blade, who is, um, uh, how do I, but it's basically uh, Conan as Daniel Boone. It's frontier adventures that involve magic. And Tommy Zambush is actually a self-contained short story that's part of a larger story with Declan. Uh, and, um, and it's very much leather stocking tail type story. Um, what's nice is the, the, the Mass Avenger is an old school magazine. He doesn't do it online. It's a small book about this big. Mine's somewhere here. I'd have to dig it up. I don't want to crawl away and get it. But, um, and he just sells it. Like, I think it's like $8. And it's like an old school fanzine you would get 20 years ago mm. and he just sells it at cons um but he's got some and i, I really like the book so um oh, cool i you know and uh, so i sent him the contrib contribution for it uh, i'm i a lot of times i will be tempted because of the project not necessarily because of the budget you know so, um, so now you you have you have covered uh several genres but but there does seem to be adventure and and magic in, in a, it sort of filters through a lot of them. Um, I you, think of myself as an adventure writer, but usually to sell these days, you have to have adventure with monsters or adventure with science fiction or adventure with horror. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so um, it kind of filters through that there's going to be that kind of, you know, I've written straight up standalone horror stories and straight up standalone mysteries. Um, but yeah, I, I'm definitely drawn to the adventure field. I mean, I, I, the, the reason I had the career I had is because as a sickly kid with, you know, with Clint Walker on TV and, and, you know, and <laughs> Diane, and I, yeah. I grew oh, up Robert in, Loggia. Okay. Now oh, we are I, buddies. I, now we I are buddies. You, I've I written, I've written two T.H.E. Cat stories from Moonstone. Oh, geez. One geez. of them is a crossover with Kolchak. Oh, uh, fine, coolest, fine. I swear to God, it was like, it's like someone came down and went, oh, here, yeah. you can enter your dream. You can't be it, but you can write it. Yes, and, yes. Um, I still, you know, I used to practice walking quietly and wearing black dickies so I could yeah. just keep it up. <laughs> um, and, um, but I, I really, um, I'm, I became the things I do um, because I wanted to be those characters. So 
I mean, that's where the I've stunt got, work came from and all that. That's absolutely. I, I was too sick to take gym, but I could teach myself how to build a box rig and jump off uh, garage roofs as rocket man. Yes. Uh, I learned to do stair falls on my high school marble stairs because they were wide enough for me to, to I would watch stunt men frame by frame on old Super 8 films and look the way their bodies moved and copy how to control it. Yes, how to yeah. control the fall. Well, yeah. This is another this this is another um, dovetail between you and Alex because Alex made his own films too uh, around the same age. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, I still got one of my Rocket Man films. I actually transferred to to DVD. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. There's a uh, you know Don McGregor. Do you know the name? Uh, I I not only do I know Don McGregor. But I'm in a movie with Don McGregor. Okay, so the Doctor Terror's House of Erotic Idiots. <laughs> Wait oh, a second. God. I'm oh God! For <laughs> I didn't Wait, know that Don were... was in that, but now that I do, <laughs> he, <laughs> plays, he plays the mayor of the town. Which who, oh. it was written by by um, by Brink Stevens and Debbie Rashawn, and Debbie Rashawn stars in it, and uh, Don plays the mayor of the town who uh, is confused and upset and screaming a lot. Well, Don um, does the screaming thing very well, yeah. He's very good at it. Yeah, right. And I, I'm in one segment as an alien space captain uh, who, um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a race that has no women. So of course their, their ship is littered with tight takeout Chinese and beer bottles. And they're looking, at, <laughs> searching the universe for a world with women. Oh uh, my God. What is the name of this movie again? Dr. Terror's House of Erotic Idiots. All right, okay. ladies and gentlemen, you know that. It's that's, a comedy. That's... It's a send up. It's a send up of old. Um, uh, you know, the old films. Hammer, well, the, yeah, the whole genre of Hammer uh, uh, Amicus films. Yeah. All it the, it, it now show. has to be part of our. Um, uh, for further studies, <laughs> uh, tell the damn story. There's, there's some hilarious, I gotta say, not necessarily my segment, but there's some hilarious stuff in it. Debbie Rajan is a really funny comedic actress. Well, and, I, I, was, I was gonna quickly say that that now that you said you're in a movie with him, I can actually also say, can you top this? I've been in several movies with Don uh, and his, his detectives and corporate characters that he created years yeah. ago in the 70s uh, we eventually did a film that he directed, he wrote and directed, and yes. I got to play the character. I, I got know, to play Ted I've, Denning. I've yet to see that. I really want to see that. Are you oh. on Facebook? Are you on Facebook? Yeah, on Facebook, yeah. The trailer is on Facebook. I'll see if I can I at least trailer, aim that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, um, it's, it's funny. All right, so for, for emerging writers, Oh yeah, there. back to them. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to to turn off the Alex Simmons time machine, yeah. uh, which was today absolutely shanghaied and turned into the Teal James <laughs> James Glenn time machine. It's all uh, wibbly wobbly time. Yeah, yes, wibbly wobbly time. Good, got um, it. For emerging authors who are just stunned by, maybe even traumatized by the output here, <laughs> um, can you talk to people about? the how done it you know um how do you produce so much what is your average time writing what is your writing uh um uh habits what are they like well um first off i'm you're not going to believe it but i'm a very slow writer uh, <laughs> I, I really am i and I'm, a thousand and five <laughs> I, I will i will take an entire day to maybe get a thousand words or 1200 okay. words done. However, I will do that every day. So right. at the end of a month, I've got 30,000 words written. Right. At the end right. of two months, I have a novel written, right. you know? Um, and um, because I, I, I look at Ray Bradbury used to say that in the morning he would get up, he would sit down and type a sentence and then go. He didn't know what he was going to type and whatever he typed, he would then just follow. And he often didn't have an idea for a story when he woke up. And um, so one of my things is there's nothing I can't write because I can imagine anything. Mm. And um, sometimes it's really good to get a challenge to like, okay, write this character. And I have no ideas. And, um, I will often get depressed 
I will say this, that this, my, I go through a cycle every couple of months. I'm like, why am I doing this? I'm never getting anywhere. I don't, um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a cycle, but I recognize that it's a cycle. And so I keep, um, I keep a book here. Years ago, I started every year, I would write down. You gotta put it right in front of you. Yeah, it disappears ever so slightly. There you go. I would write down, like, this is July 2021. And I'll have sent, and it's all the short stories I sent out. Um, uh, these books are here. Uh, wrote back and forth with, with publisher. Hard deadline, mm -hmm. October 1. Received edits for Semper Occultus. Um, sent back July 5th. Um, pitched Ghostmaker 2. And I will write down everything that I'm doing that pertains to the career uh, or a major event like, you know, uh, had teeth out, couldn't work for three days or something like that. Mm. Um, because I'm, I remember years ago, I got to a Christmas and I was like really depressed. It was coming to be New Year's. And a friend asked me why. I said, I didn't do anything this year. And they said, are you kidding? You did this, 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 this. And I, 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 because I'm in the middle of it, I don't think of it. So I started writing down what I actually had done. Mm-hmm. Great idea. And, and, you know, right now they have the 2022 uh, books out like that. So a lot of emerging authors go and get one of those. Yeah. I mean, I, I literally write that down. Yeah. I, I it when I get depressed, I look at that and go, OK, I wasn't a lazy pig last month. I did right. this, this, this and this. And I, yeah. I dealt with this, this, this and this. I'm, I'm a big list maker because that gets I look at a list and I can. Anytime I can cross something off a list, it feels I feel good. Pumped. Even if even if I make it up just to cross it off, <laughs> you know, because uh, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. it, who can who can delude themselves more better than a writer, That's you know? Because right. um, we all think we're, <laughs> we're we're going to be Stephen King, you know. Yeah. Um, it's all, they're already that job's already taken. Except <laughs> I have been hit by more cars than Stephen King. And oh, I have uh, film to prove it. Yeah. Uh, that's, well, yeah, but you were getting paid for it. He well, was exactly. just minding so, his own business, reading a book. <laughs> that's that's the thing. If you make the agreement in advance, it makes you better. You know, <laughs> you know um, so I, I really think that um, my, my work habit is just I get up and I write. I try to write whenever I can. I'm, if I'm not writing, I'm thinking about right. I think I think four or five days is my absolute maximum without writing. I start to like get mental hives. I, yeah. I freak out. Um, it is my safety mechanism. It is my release. It is my um, my sense that I'm doing something that matters. Mm. And I have a daughter and I, I, I really have nothing to leave her except these intellectual properties. And I would like some of them to be successful enough to matter that I can leave them to her and say, here, someday these will, will matter for you. These will be something. I don't have a, you know, I don't have a plot of land. I don't have, you know, a corporate name, right. but if I can leave her the rights to a cowboy and Carpathia and 10 years from now, somebody decides to make it into a movie. It would be a great movie, something. by the way. Um, it would be a great movie. I, I, you know, it's funny. I, I wrote the, uh, the cowboy and the conqueror first. <laughs> and um, and then I said, I really need to go back and, and deal with him not dying because I wrote right. it just starting. Um, sure. And um, yeah, because the, the second book is written from the point of view of the other writer mm. who sees him standing on the deck of a ship and goes, that's the cowboy I write about in my books. And he goes over and says hello. And it turns out that they're both pulp writers and the adventure is fantastic. Story. And um, so. I, I want to be able to leave something for her. Uh, and also I want to reach that 15 year old kid out there, that 10 year old kid, that 20 year old kid, that, that sickly writer who maybe could, you know, use a little enjoyment for an evening. Oh I mean, man, that was, it was very key. Um, too much darkness in the world. There, yeah. there needs to be light. Damn, what, damn what, great. Damn amen. Great. What do you, uh, what's your policy on rewrites? I rewrite constantly. If, if um, before you send, before you send oh, out, yes, I, I'm. I'm very lucky right now. Um, aside from uh, my friend Carol, who you know, who sure. is, is my like super beta reader, 
um, I'm in a writer's group with, with four others. Um, and um, we meet Monday nights, um, on, you know, we make, have a phone call. We read, read two to 4,000 words of our work that week. And um, they're really good at giving, at, at, I mean, they, they don't hear it until I've rewritten it three or four times, right. but then they hear it and they'll just say, oh, I, I need more description of that room. Or um, you use the word chair three times in that paragraph right. or, you know, and so it really helps polish the work. Uh, and, um, uh, and it wasn't my first writer's group. I'd been in two other writer's groups and they weren't right for me. In fact, they mm, really yeah. didn't like what I wrote. Uh, they were it's very difficult to artsy, find a artsy, writer's group that works. Yeah, yeah. artsy fartsy intellectuals who yeah. did not understand the concept of adventure writing, really. Yeah. Um, I, I have a, a novel, uh, Call Down the Lightning, which is um, about a, a wounded uh, Afghan vet um, who one member of his group is killed. You know, it's an old trope, but I tried to do something with it. Um, but the, the wounded, uh, he, the friend who's killed is uh, Native American. He's, yeah. he's Iroquois and at Mohawk specifically. And um, the writer's group, it goes back to the whole write in your own lane. We're all upset that I had a, a, uh, a drunken um, um, Native American in the opening of the story who, but the whole, the book is about PTS. Right. And that's, that was the whole point is that- But they couldn't get past with, that to the story. They couldn't get past it to the story. And, yeah. um, and mind you, um, I have some Cherokee blood, but I also, I have Diné friends and, huh. um, uh, Lenape friends who read my stuff for me as well yeah. to make sure that it, it's right. And, um, and they couldn't get past that. They couldn't, they didn't understand why, you know, why I was writing the story about a guy who had his arm blown off and was dealing with it. And, you know, and all of, and I'm like, you know, but I'm like, well, it's because I want to write a story about what happens. The, the, the whole point of the story was that, um, violence leaves a toll and you usually write like for instance killing shadows he's an afghan vet but it's written in a more adventure tone there's nods to the fact that violence is a problem and and you know he has nightmares occasionally but it's written with just a nod to it like the bond books there's a mm -hmm. nod to it but it's not what the story's about call down the lightning the story was about how do you try to reconstruct your life when your life has been blown to hell literally Right. And um, so it's an adventure story, but it's, it's I think, deeper. Um, and um, of course, that's the one I haven't been able to place um, because it may be having a this, little too much. Uh, this, um, reality to it. But I, you know, I went through special forces friends of mine to review it. And I took, uh, I actually took extra gun training to make sure that um, everything in it was accurate because military guys, if you get the wrong button on the shirt, gotta, they go nuts. Gotta get it right, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but that's I, I scream at the History Channel, so I understand that. <laughs> you know? But we are in a world right now, a publishing world, where where people see something and it, it triggers them before they get through the, the paragraph. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. I was in a writers group where I was an Indian writer in there of some success, yeah. and uh, she saw that I had an Indian character in there. She happened to be a, an on-air reporter. And as soon as she saw that, she says, well, you, you have to do this character right. I said, you, we, we just saw her holding the mic, asking questions. We didn't get, she, you don't really get, the story is not about her. Yeah, she's just the there. It's about New York yeah. City, and New York City is a diverse city. She's like, oh, but, you know, it could be offensive. And I was like, why are you jumping on the negative? Yeah. It, the fact show, me where, show me where it's offensive. But that's, well, that's the thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an, very easily triggered, man. I'm an old cis white guy, so I got to be really careful. I mean, the the mm -hmm. uh, John Shadows is is mixed blood. He is, you know, he's Korean, Japanese, and 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 Scott, uh, you know. Um, and, and Scots uh, get offended very easily, so you got to be very careful. It's that. true. It's true. Yeah, really, it's, yeah. Throw shortbread at them, and they're fine. Yeah, really. Uh, right. <laughs> and, so, what do we what do we tell writers about how to deal with the current uh, politics of writing? Just write the damn story. 
honestly. I mean, Tell it, the it damn comes story, down to ladies and gentlemen. Write the story. Find you know, find a sensitivity reader. Absolutely. Yeah. But um, first, I mean, I try to just write people, mm -hmm. and you know, I just try to write people that are real. I mean, I I don't go too far outside my lane, but if I'm writing a character who's not uh, an old white guy. Um, it's usually based on someone I know or someone yeah. I've met. And so I try to write observantly about them. And I've yet to make any of them villains because um, I don't really like villains. So I don't spend a lot of time with my villains. I'm not one of those people who really thinks um, you have to understand the villain. No, you don't. You're a villain. You know, you picked a side already. <laughs> You've picked a side. There's no reason you can maybe understand why they're doing it, but you don't have to sympathize with them. I mean, Dracula is not a nice guy. I got, <laughs> I can't tell you that the cattle got on my case so hard because of Dracula drinking that cat's blood. Um, it was about the cat. It spoiler, wasn't about anything yeah, else. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Um, but you know, I, I really, I don't hold with the making villains main characters. Right. I, I can I, I want to understand villains don't just wake up and go, I'll be a villain today because everyone's a hero in their own story. Mm. Um, but I'm not telling their story. I'm telling the other guy's story. So they're going to be on the other side of the fence. Right. It's just that simple. Butch Cavendish is just a bad guy because he likes to steal and kill and doesn't care. We don't have to go into his childhood being abused, you know. <laughs> All we know is that he falls off the cliff and the, sorry, spoiler alert, and the Lone Ranger gets to live. Um, <laughs> so it's so, like a 60 year spoiler right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So very quickly, I have two more questions for, for Teal. Very quickly. You'll notice, by the way, this did not make a half hour mark there. Okay. No, neither one. We went blue right. right past it. Yeah. Um, how did everything get kind of stuck in the funnel? And come out all know. in September and October. I honestly don't know. I know that I sent out a lot of stuff last year. Okay. Um, and um, so it was the Teal James Glenn uh, dynamic engine rather than explosion. It's just you're sending I, so much stuff out that I, eventually I think, this is going to happen. I think so. I mean, I, I um, my policy is that anything that's rejected goes out within two to three days. Okay. I find a new market and it goes out. If they how, how do you give us two bits of advice on how to find a new market? Um, I go, there's, there's two places that I find constantly are useful. Duotrope.com yep. and uh, Rayland.com. R-A-L-A-N. Okay. Raylan. And uh, the Rayland tends to be for science fiction. Duotrope is pretty much anything. Uh, but there's also Submission Grinder, which I don't like because it's a little weird. I, I'm not techno, and there's there's like a lot of questions you got to answer. Um, Duotrope, you can put in style, length, type, uh, how much you want to get paid, whether they accept electronics, whether they take reprints, and mm -hmm. whether they have subgenre, and you can just boom put it in, and you'll get a list of stuff that comes up. Uh, my biggest problem is I tend not to write short, okay. so um, you sell more things under five thousand words than over. And I okay. tend to write a lot of stuff that's six, eight, ten thousand 10,000 words. Today's um, episode of Tell a Damn Story brought to you by Duotrope. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, All right. And no. wait, I'm sorry. Wait, 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 Len, I'm what, sorry. what were you going to finish? What were you going to say there? Oh, I said, I, I've gotten really good at cutting my stuff. I will write an eight or 10,000 word story and I'm pretty good. And I've been able to sell 6,000 or 5,000 word versions of it, which... Hmm. I follow the Edgar Rice Burroughs formula. Everything sells three times. First rights, second rights, and a collection, or even a third right or audio. So a lot of my stories, there's a 7,000 word version and a 4,000 word version, or a 10,000 word version, and a, a, you know, and so um, I can keep them rotating that way. Um, and if there's enough changes, it's a different story. If it's more than 20, 30% change, it's really a, a new story. Gotcha. Um, I mean, if you read Jaws, it's about a shark that eats so many people they close the beach. But if you read it backwards, it's about a shark that throws up so many people they have to open the beach. Absolutely, right, wasn't my joke. Was <laughs> oh my god, oh jeez, that's okay. Um, you know, Teal, I can edit that out. 
<laughs> <It's> terrible. <laughs> I love that joke, but it's so terrible. Yeah. Um, Three riders and- walk into a bar. They never leave. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. End of story. Um, of course, now you're just laying back on your laurels, enjoying nothing else is happening. And your heart the year, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mean stand. Um, well, actually, I have two more books coming out that I know of for sure. Um, I'm I'm doing the gallery That's... proof of Dragon Throat, which is uh, a full length Altiva novel. Um, That's your fan sword and sorcery. That's my sword series? and sorcery the world. Right. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, right. And um, and I'm I'm this this is actually one that I wrote quite a while ago. It was out. Publisher passed away, and it's been sitting fallow for about 15 years. So it's rewritten and cleaned up and coming out from Airship. Gorgeous illustrations by Chris Nye. That's um, great. And um, so and that when they get so it back, uh, probably a month or two from now, it'll be out. They're waiting for a cover from uh, Michael Youngblood. Um, yeah, he does some really nice covers. So I'm I'm excited about that. And uh, so are uh, you thinking are you thinking that's going to be out in December or next year? Uh, it, it could be out in November. I think that'll probably be out in November. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the second Dr. Argent will probably be out next year. And the second Cowboy and Carpathia will, uh, will almost certainly be out next year. Because Tommy at, at Pro Se, um, he's got a bunch of stuff in the queue. And some of it is waiting. Tommy out. always has a bunch of stuff in the queue. Yeah, well, you know, he, <laughs> he, he, he clogged up for a while and slowed down. But he is really... He's back coming on back. Mark and stuff's coming out now on a regular basis. That's beautiful. Um, mm. And we I mean, had written I, some stuff. We really want to be part of a project he was doing, but it, you know, it's on the, it's on the sidelines and we'll, hopefully it comes back up. That would yeah. Be well, I mean, well, he had cowboy for a while. Yeah. Uh, and um, so he's catching up on that and he's got a couple of really cool things. He just announced uh, he's got a bunch of Lester Dent characters. That yes. Just I just saw that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you have uh, mystery men and women number seven. Yes, it's uh, from Airship 27. I have a series called The Exceptionals, which is um, um, bio-enhanced bounty hunters. Really set amazing. Year 2030. And uh, the three books are out, but they're prisoner of a zombie company. I've been trying to get the rights back. So this is actually a novella that's separate from all of those with those characters uh, called Walk in the Park. That's and it's cool. about, um, it takes place in the year 2031 and is... Uh, going after a terrorist in a, in a, a sleazy nightclub in Paris. Oh, in Marseille, excuse me, in Marseille. Um, and um, yeah, Mystery Men and Women is interesting. It's Airship 27. It's an anthology book that is just uh, heroes, superheroes, mass characters. And so you never know what you're gonna get in any given issue. Mm. Uh, and it's a great way to kind of try characters out. They do novellas, roughly about 15,000 words, give or take. So um, uh, it's, it's kind of cool. I'm actually, I'm working on one of my uh, Altiva, uh, basically an Altiva version of Zorro, a masked character in fantasy world um, cool. that I'm hoping to send into him. He's probably hearing it for the first time if he hears this, but- Hey, uh, <laughs> good to see you. Uh, but um, yeah, cause I, one of the things about Altiva is I have written every kind of story you can imagine. I've got eight different books and two of those are just collections of short stories with non-series characters or minor series characters. That Would you, um, would you ever put out an omnibus? Uh, I would love someday to be enough of them to be out to do that. Because um, be it, cool. it's Dragon Throat actually marks the, like, the renaissance of Altiva. The fact that Untold Quest came out before it or just before it is almost coincidental, but um, those are the first two Altiva stories. I've had some short stories in like Sword and Sorcery Magazine. I just sold a bunch of short stories to them, um, but I haven't had any publications with Altiva for a while. So mm. this is hopefully um, I've got, you know, I've got three other novels that'll hopefully at least one will be out next year with Altiva. I'd like to get enough for people to see the, the breadth of the world. Cause I have four different series that don't intersect set on that world. So I know the world, I know the, the politics, the religion, and I keep building more um, as I go along. So um, you're Tolkien. Um, well, I, I hope I'm not that boring. Um, oh, oh, uh, body blow, body blow. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, 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 look, I read, I read The Lord of the Rings three successive Friday nights 
each book um, when I was, you know, I, I guess, 13. I loved it. But I, on rereading it, I skipped the 45 pages about the Shire and go right to the story. That's why I kind of am more a Robert E. Howard guy. Uh, my view is that fantasy, high fantasy, is you're standing in the castle looking over the land. My kind of sword and sorcery fantasy is you're in the back alley stepping over horse dung. Yeah, and I got you. That's what I, write. <laughs> I, I got you. There are no privies in uh, Middle Earth. You know, no yeah, one in Middle Earth in. ever has diarrhea. <laughs> no one in Middle Earth ever gets collar. Um, but in in my Altiva world, I mean, Lord Shout is is a is a physician, so it's as much about uh, dealing with poverty and blood and gore and. One of the things, you know, Minds of Fantasy series, because there's absolute, except for one religion, which nobody likes, there's absolute equality for sex and race. They don't even use terms like kinsmen. It's kinsfolk. Hmm. So you are writing fantasy. Exactly. Yeah, That's yeah. how you can tell it's a fantasy world. So oh, let me let beautiful. me let that's me bring right. this let me that's bring good. this back to the the first question at the very beginning, because we are now at the end. Why? do you write and you have you've touched on it several times during this interview but in bringing this to a close for these emerging writers and other members of our listeners why do you write because i want to find out what happens i want to go to these places i want to be with these people um <clears throat> i want to make a better world and Aside from my personal interactions with people, one of the ways to do that is with my words. And um, just like I got a moral code from Paladin, and, <laughs> and, God. you know, and, uh, and, uh, and Conan, um, because Conan never takes anyone against their will. Conan makes a promise, he keeps it for all of his barbarism. He's a straight up guy. Mm. I, I want, to be that in my personal life. And if I can put that on the page and bring you with me to that story, we can meet in that world together. And that to me is what writing is supposed to be is, is connecting with people. And um, I write because I can't not write. I've tried. <laughs> when I, I finished Murder Most Fair, which is a, a, a murder mystery about my friend's death. Um, about three weeks before my daughter was born. And I didn't write again for about eight years because I had to put my time into, you know, falling down and making money. But uh, yeah, I'm hoping to find a new publisher for that. That publisher went out of business. Mm, uh, it was the last one to buy a cup. And, um, and uh, but, <clears throat> um, but during those eight years, I missed it. It was, you know, I think the only thing I wrote was actually one Altiva short story in that eight years. Um, and, but since then, I have not stopped since, since I started again. Uh, and since about 20 years ago, I made the decision I'm going to be a writer because I can always fall down, but eventually I won't be able to get up. I've mm. just about reached that point. So now what's the next thing? What can I do? And if I can't be the character, I can be in the character. I can create the character. So I write because I, I have to. I, I don't have any other choice. And I really, I'm blessed that people are actually liking my stuff and that people are actually reading my stuff um, because I otherwise I'd just be a diarist. I mean, I, I write for people to, to share it. I, I write to get in there with other people. Um, but I'm incredibly blessed that I'm able to do that. Um, you know, circumstances have conspired to allow me to have electronics and during the year where everybody was locked in a room by themselves, um, I got to go to Altiva, I got to go to Victorian England, I got to go to the, to the Southwest, you know. Um, you were locked in a room with hundreds of other characters. Yeah, yeah. really. Uh, it was just like Grand Central Station, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, Teal, that's that's fantastic. That is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. You, you yes. wanna... Well, if you want to read uh, about Teal's amazing other lives, 
Uh, keep an eye on pulpfest.com. The Pulpfest profile on Teal James Glenn will be coming up within the next couple of weeks. And as amazing as all of this is, his roots are just as amazing. So uh, uh, is there a website, Teal, that they can uh, check yes. out as well? Um, there is a website which is woefully out of date. And that was one of the things that was going to get done before the, the, the lockdown. It's going to get done in the next couple of months. It's theurbanswashbuckler.com. There you go. Um, and it's kind of out of date, but it's still there. Um, and uh, social media, anything? Uh, I'm on Facebook, Teal James Glenn on Facebook. Um, there you go. And yeah, and I'm on Twitter, but I swear to God, I don't go very often. Yeah. I, I, it's, I, I, I guess I just can't write much in 40, you know, 140 characters. <laughs> far, too, far too little for you. Yes. Um, the yeah. urban swashbuckler.com. Yes, sir. Right. Okay. I just, and I, if you read the pulp, uh, the, uh, uh, the pulpfest.com uh, article, you'll see why he's the urban swashbuckler. Well, uh, one of the things I'm proudest of is I got to study with Errol Flynn's last stunt double. There you so. go. Spoilers. Yeah, sorry, he sorry. just knocked one of my paragraphs out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Teal, it has been a joy. Uh, we hope that uh, emerging writers get a kick out of how free you are with your imagination and how your productivity catches up with itself with publications. And I hope it gives them all a shot in the arm to go and sit down and start telling typing again, ladies and gentlemen. I'll, I'll, I'll have you know. Yeah. I, I'm going through a psychological problem because so far I have not sold anything I've written this year. Everything I've sold this year was written previously and I'm kind of complex about it. <laughs> well, well, if, know, we look, it if we look cyclic. at the cycle here, Teal, next year, all of the stuff you wrote this year is going to blow the publishing industry apart. It's, it's entirely possible, but I, I, my friends keep pounding it on me like, it's just an arbitrary thing the year. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah, but, you know, I have this great character, Jack Silence, that I've written seven, I, I've written essentially a novel's worth. There's seven short stories that link together. I haven't been able to place any of them anywhere, and it drives me nuts. Okay, well, I... put one in an email and send it to me now, so that can be <laughs> then you can say you placed that. So, you know, thanks, <laughs> thanks very much. And you know what? Obviously, you have much more to share and talk about, so we'll have to bring you back. Yes, I I look forward to sitting down over a soda and chatting with you for hours, yes. Alex. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you know, absolutely. you dropped you dropped Paladin. I mean, yeah, <laughs> if, if that way. happens, it's gonna we're gonna have to rename the podcast <laughs> the Teal and Alex Time Machine, and I'm gonna be sitting there like this. <laughs> well, I have this. I, I one of the things I'm doing now is I have an old producer friend of mine who. Um, we were talking a couple of days ago and uh, he has a streaming service and he's doing a lot of public domain stuff. He's re beautiful remasters of this stuff. Right. And we're talking about something and I mentioned it and he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought I was in the sh world's shortest line with knowing this stuff. You're ahead of me in the line. I am captain obscurity. So he hired me. I'm now doing research of public domain TV shows. Cause that's, I sit and I read, total television for fun um <laughs> i i sit here and i look up obscure shows oh, okay 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 one one <laughs> who, is the, who is the star of an obscure tv series called the lieutenant uh gary um uh oh god i can see his face gary Mer not merrill gary l l, l, l. l. Yeah, gary yeah. yeah there you That's go all right here's yeah. one for you <laughs> Who was the star of Harlem Precinct in 1954? Now, see, you totally got me there. I, I don't, Channel I haven't seen that one. WOR, New York, did its own original program. 14 episodes were aired before it was taken off the air because the star was called out as being a communist. William Marshall. Ooh. It was a realistic police drama. William set Marshall. In, set in I Harlem. Am great. I am great. You are great. Yes. yes. <laughs> Tatakombe, Tatakombe. Yes, there you go. There you yeah, go. Wonderful. But, but, but th that's one of those shows that was a local show shot in New York that was called out because it was a mixed race cast set in a Harlem precinct and the cop was a normal human being. Yeah, and yeah. 
freaked 50, out America. 54, I was two years old, so yeah. yeah. That's no excuse. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I didn't start watching those shows until I was two and a half. So you know. Oh, there you go. There, there you go. go. Okay, we got to go. We got to go. But this is great. Thank you again Thank you. so much, Teal. Thank you, Chris. Welcome. Yeah, I really appreciate both of you being here. I appreciate even though you. I don't understand the last five minutes of the show. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's why we speak in Klingon. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so everybody, take care, and we will see you again next time. Peace.